And I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of John. And as you turn there, I am so thankful for our musicians. It occurred to me today when I was unwrapping the piano for them and setting out the chair and the music stand, how are they going to play with such cold weather? Their fingers must be numb. And so God bless you, our musicians who accompany us in all of this. But as we begin our time in the Word of God this morning, <clears throat> I'm going to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 11. We're going to look almost at the entire passage uh, of John chapter 11, verse 1 through verse 44. And it's a message I've entitled, Your Assurance of Your resurrection from the dead. Let's begin with a word of prayer because we're going to be dealing with the matter of death and resurrection from the dead for the believer in Christ. So let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we come to our time now where we're about to enter into the word of God. And we're going to come to that time where we spend with you, listening to you. Thank you for that lesson given to me so many years ago by Brother Billy McIntyre, who reminded me, oftentimes as we begin our worship service, you're that one listening to all that we've been doing. You've listened to the hymns, you've listened to the scripture readings, you've listened to the prayers that have been offered. Thank you that you've been so kind to listen to our prayers. May they be a sweet-smelling savor in your nostrils. But now, Lord, as we come, it's time for us to listen to you. And as Rechart so rightly said, as a dear brother in Christ, in his opening prayer, in his opening statements, may we have ears to listen and hearts to receive, that we might go from this place rejoicing in the truths that we're about to encounter regarding the whole subject of death and what happens to the believer after death. So now as we come, Lord, still our anxious hearts, for as a body of Christ, we are having to deal with many who have already, in just this past month, gone home to be with you, through the valley of the shadow of death. Thank you, they are safe with you. But for we who remain, may this be a time of great comfort, great encouragement. And I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our passage this morning, <clears throat> we're going to encounter a statement given by the Lord Jesus Christ. You find it in John chapter 11, and in verse 25 and verse 26, it says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha's reply, because that's who Jesus is speaking to, is, Oh yes, I believe. But here's the thing. Many of us, given the world we live in, where man's word is no longer his bond, we are therefore just like that ancient man who cried out to Jesus Christ, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. If we're honest with ourselves, too many are like him. We are quick to say, I do believe. But deep down, we admit, help me in my unbelief. I am so thankful for the goodness, kindness, and patience of our Lord with us because he's here to help us grasp an assurance of your and my resurrection from the dead as a believer in Christ. And I have the privilege of leading us 
to understand these wonderful truths by sharing with us the detail regarding a narrative surrounding the death, the burial, and the resurrection of a real man, Lazarus. So, here we are encountering the encouraging truths that affirm the assurance of your and my resurrection from the dead should we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and die as a born-again believer in Christ is going to be revealed to you and I as we deal with the, with the narrative. So let me begin this way. Years ago, it was asked of John Wesley, as death stalks all men and women, what makes a Christian so special? That was the question that was asked of John Wesley. John Wesley replied, and I quote, Our people die well. That was his reply. I truly think John Wesley is spot on the mark. Believers in Jesus Christ, if it is in his will that they walk through the valley of the shadow of death and close their eyes in death, the believer dies calmly. The believer dies well. All because of the promise that they know and believe that the moment they close their eyes in death, in an instant they will open them in the very presence of our eternal Lord and Savior, beholding Him face to face, and enjoy from that moment onward a face-to-face -face living, eternal fellowship with Him and other believers in Christ. Scripture is full of those kinds of assurances. But if you just stop for a moment and consider what we have so far seen in the Gospel of John, we have so far seen in the Gospel of John, just in John chapter 10 alone, that Jesus declares himself to be the good and the great shepherd. And because of Jesus Christ being the good and great shepherd, as he proclaims in John chapter 10, when you get to John chapter 11, it's all about proving his statements in John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. No one will snatch them from my hand. And when you get to John chapter 11 and you find a real man, Lazarus, has succumbed to death. Death cannot snatch Lazarus from Jesus' hand because he is the good and great shepherd. And so proof that Jesus will take care of his sheep, as he promised in John chapter 10, is all about John chapter 11. And just as Psalm 23, specifically verses 4 through 6, has been a comfort to countless believers over all the ages. John chapter 11 is the proof of Psalm 23, verse 4 through 6. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. John specifically, though, in the gospel that bears his name, he pointedly recounts the events around, uh, surrounding Lazarus' resurrection. And he does so because he wants to walk his reader, you and I, through the truths of Jesus Christ's ability and willingness, willingness rather, to rescue you as, and I 
as believers in Jesus Christ from the clutches of death. Death for the believer in Christ becomes a gateway to further life and fellowship with the Lord. It's a gateway to life as it's always meant to have been from creation. To be in sweet fellowship, walking with the Lord in the cool of the day, and all of that is possible. Not because of a work we've done, but because of a work Jesus Christ has completed and continues to build on that work. We have a hope, not a wishful thinking, but a hope resting on the promises of God in His Word, in His Son, through His Holy Spirit. And God is not like us. He does not lie. So our hope rests on Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ died and was resurrected. And so it will be for us because the assurance of our own resurrection rests upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ because this is how it works. As it happened to Jesus in this life, it happens to you and I. Jesus was misunderstood. You are misunderstood. Jesus was falsely accused. You are falsely accused. Jesus was persecuted. You are persecuted. Maybe not to the extent where you've been whipped 39 times and beaten with a rod so that your visage is marred. But some have. As happens to Jesus Christ, happens to you. Jesus said, listen, I'm your master. They've done this to me. Why are you so confused and perplexed that they would not do this to you? But thankfully, Jesus, even though he died, he is living. And so as happens to Jesus, happens to you. We too as believers in Christ, will live after death. When we believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sin and His salvation given us, the sting of death is gone. Oh, wait, that death is still that ugly scorpion. It is still that cobra, but that ugly scorpion has been de-stinged, if that's a word. That cobra's had its fangs removed. So you don't want to cuddle it on your lap, but it will have no danger to you. That ugly scorpion that is death is still there, but that sting's been removed. And even though that scorpion is still as ugly as ever, it is harmless to the believer in Christ. Now, I need to also point out to us the obvious as we're going to encounter it in John chapter 11 that this chapter contains one of the seven I am statements which John includes into his gospel. It is where John says, I am the resurrection and the life. In fact, that's the whole purpose. And Jesus confronts Martha and says, do you believe in this? And that is the purpose that John wrote his gospel, that these things have been written that you may believe. And having believed in him, you may have life in his name. So John purposely, through the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, structures and organizes his gospel around those proofs. But John's purpose in John chapter 11 is the assurance of the good and great shepherd in John chapter 10, who will rescue his sheep and deliver his sheep from that fearsome enemy, death. This is a good shepherd you and I can trust. This is a good shepherd you and I can put our confidence in, not just for a day, but for eternity.
This is a good and great shepherd who is forgiving and who is powerful. This is the good shepherd who will walk you through the valley of the shadow of death and deliver you safely into his presence. John chapter 7, uh, sorry, 11, is where you and I get to see in real time a real man who really died, but who was really brought back to life by Jesus Christ, the good and great shepherd. So as we traverse our way through the narrative, there's not much we can make comment on, so it will go quickly, but we're going to look at the following points. We're going to begin with understanding the infection of Lazarus. Then we're going to look at the discussion that flows out of the infection of Lazarus. Then we're going to look at the situation. Then we're going to see the doctrine, the teaching, and then we're going to see the resurrection. So as we traverse our way, We'll deal with the infection, the discussion, the situation, the doctrine, and the resurrection. Let's look at the first, the infection, verses 1 through 6 of John chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, or Bethany, means actually place of the fig, house of the fig, okay? There was a man sick. Lazarus of Bethany, Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment, ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. There's the infection. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he, Jesus Christ, then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now let's understand something, okay? In our modern world, illness, sickness, is often no more than just, frankly speaking, an inconvenience. But in Jesus' day, the slightest wound, the slightest cold could kill you. A toothache could see your demise. Imagine a world without disprin for your headache. Imagine a world where there is no disprin for relief, no medicine for cure, as we know it today. And also remember, by this time, Jesus had already performed many miracles of healing people. <laughs> He'd restored the sight of a man born blind from birth. He had healed a man, lame and sick, at the pools of Bethesda, who had been there for 38 years. So what Jesus had done for others, Martha and Mary figured he can do for Lazarus. So hence, Martha and Mary, send Mary's they send their request. Now let's also understand something. Lazarus and his sister lived in Bethany. Bethany. It's just outside of Jerusalem. It's a little village that you get to just before you crest over the Mount of Olives and see the Kidron Valley below you and the Temple Mount in front of you and Jerusalem, the ancient city. But it's only about five kilometers from Jerusalem center. It's close by. It's no more than two miles, as we will see in the scriptures, 5Ks, there, thereabouts. We also know that after Jesus' altercation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes in the temple precinct in John chapter 10, when they wanted to stone him, remember? It says he withdrew to a deserted place. 
Well, that place is beyond the Jordan. So Jesus, as we know, he has crossed the Jordan River, probably in the region of Jericho. He's made his way over the Jordan River and is in where we would now know modern-day Jordan, probably somewhere between what we know to be the city of Amman today, who in ancient times would have been the city of Philadelphia, one of the Decapolis cities. But we also know that he was in that deserted place. So he was not in the cities, but just on the other side of the Jordan River. The point is this. It's only a day's walk from Jerusalem to Jericho and to where Jesus was just over the, the river. Only a day's walk. You drive there in a bus in 45 minutes. It's a day's walk. And so the call goes out to the great physician. And we also know if we do a timeline search and let the scriptures interpret the scriptures, this is probably taking place now around about January, February, or March. Because remember, the festival of lights, Hanukkah, which is John chapter 10, when Jesus proclaims, I'm the good and great shepherd. And then they get all angry because he's equating himself to be with God. They want to stone him. He goes to a deserted place. That's December. So we find Jesus across the Jordan River in a deserted place, probably around about January, February, maybe even March. That means this is just before his crucifixion in the April that will follow. So the call goes out to the great physician. And frankly speaking, Jesus' response is a little surprising. That's because Jesus Christ has a different plan to Martha and Mary and his disciples. They are all hoping God would be glorified by the healing of Lazarus. But God has a different plan that he would glorify himself and at the same time be a comfort to the believer in Christ. So, Jesus delays. Now, let me set a timeline for us, because this is important, all right? Let me set a timeline for us. Day one, Martha and Mary send word to, G to Jesus, Lazarus is sick. Heal him. Come and heal him. Jesus gets the message the same day. Remember, it's only a day's walk from Bethany to where Jesus is. Still in day one, Lazarus dies. Now, we know that because we're going to see that we can work it out a little bit later. But still in day one, Lazarus dies. And Jesus knows this. His disciples don't. Day two and day three, Jesus stays in that deserted place. Day four, Jesus says to his disciples, let's go. Let's depart from beyond the Jordan and let's return to Bethany. They would have got there around about mid-afternoon. So Jesus' announcement that they should go to Lazarus on day four sparks a discussion. That's my next point. We've seen the infection. It led to death. Jesus spends time in this deserted place. Strange reaction, but he's got a different plan to Martha, Mary, and the disciples. So now let's look at the discussion. Look at verses 7 through 16. Then after this, and I'm going to make co a comment as we go, all right? Verse 7 through verse 16, John chapter 11, second point, the discussion. Then after this, he, Jesus Christ, says to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, now they're still remembering John chapter 10 and the end of the feast of Hanukkah. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews who were just now, in other words, just like last month, seeking to stone you, and you're going to go there again? Here is disciples, the twelve, including Judas, they're in the dark. But Jesus isn't, and that's why he says what he says in verse 9 through 10. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But 
If anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. What a strange reply. Not really. Jesus is a consummate teacher. Remember John chapter 10? I am the light of the world. I am the good and great shepherd. I'm going to lead you. You just have to keep your eyes on me. This is not a mission. We will be there before the night goes down. And anyway, even if the night is there, hey, I'm the light. I'm with you. So if the disciples would just keep their eyes on Jesus in the next unfolding moments of all that uncertainty, all of that sadness, all of that grief related to the death of a loved one, they won't stumble. Why? Because he, Jesus Christ, is the light. He, Jesus Christ, is the good and great shepherd. He will guide, he will lead, he will protect, he will provide. And so he gives them a veiled purpose in verse 11. Then this he, Jesus Christ, said to them after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. Verse 12, the disciples haven't still got it. They said to him, Lord, uh, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death. That would be Lazarus' death. But they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus clears up their confusion. He takes away any guess now. Verse 14. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. Ah, oh, hang on. Here Jesus has got a whole purpose now about Lazarus' death. I was glad that, you, that I was not there so that outcome you may believe. But... Let us go to him. Therefore, verse 16, Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, so that we may die with him. When Jesus says, I am glad, folks, I just need to clear this up. It's not that he is pleased at the death of Lazarus. He is pleased for the opportunity to lead his disciples into a greater belief in who he is, what he's done, what he is doing, and what he will yet do. As the Savior of the world, the good and great shepherd, the perfect Lamb of God. Now let's also understand something about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. This is not the first miraculous resurrection from the dead that Jesus has already done. He's already raised up. We didn't look at this, but in Mark chapter 5, Jesus, when he's in northern Israel around the Galilee area, he's raised up Jairus' daughter from the dead. So this would not be his first resurrection. What makes the resurrection of Lazarus different from Jarius's daughter's resurrection is that the resurrection of, G of Lazarus is accompanied by a theological teaching. And that's what we need to be careful we don't miss. This means when Jesus says, I am glad so that you may believe there's a teaching coming and that teaching is important. It means, though, that this is a carefully planned miracle to teach what? Jesus' power over death and to explain it where you and I can believe it. Notice, Jesus, Jesus also clearly knows what he's doing. He doesn't say, let's go, Lazarus is dead. Let's go view the corpse and mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who weep. Let's go pay our respects in today's language. And I must hasten to point out, 
Be careful of judging Thomas here, okay? He's been labeled as the doubting Thomas. Not fair. Because when you look at the Greek and you understand the grammar that was used in the Greek, you come away in understanding that Thomas's statement isn't as resigned as you think. Oh, well, let's go, to, let's go with him. We'll just die with him as no, no whatever, okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. No, no. Actually, you could say it this way. Thomas says, let's go. And even if it means into the lion's den, let's go. But let's keep our eyes on him. That's the way the Greek grammar, literally, if you interpret it properly, you come away with that understanding. This is not a <sighs> resigned. No, no, this is a, okay. It's unnerving, guys, but we can do this. So that brings us, we've seen the infection. We've seen the discussion. Now we must look at the situation. Verse 17 through verse 19. So when Jesus came, remember, this is day four, he found that he, Lazarus, had already been dead in the tomb. How many days? Four days. It says so in the text. When did Jesus get the message? Day one. What did he do? Stayed where he was. Day two, day three. Day four, what does he do? Let's go. And he begins his journey at the beginning of day four. He gets to Bethany around about the end of day four, mid-afternoon. So, when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, hence five Ks. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So here we look at the situation Jesus is faced with. We see, firstly, the time. It's day four. We see, secondly, the place. It's Bethany, place of the fig, home of the fig. In fact, it's the place where Jesus curses a fig tree, okay? Bethany, and the burial place is, it's, it's taken, the burial's taken place. And we see the people, and we see their condition. Hope has been abandoned. Seen in the statements of Martha and Mary separately to Jesus, as well as the conduct of the mourners. Now, a word as to why we're specifically told by John, Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. Because Jewish tradition and some very orthodox Jews, he would even hold to this today, but Jewish tradition was rampant in the time of Christ. Their rabbis were teaching that the spirit of the deceased person always hovered around the body of the deceased person for three days following their death. But day four, that spirit had left. There's no coming back from that. So that tells us Jesus raises a real man, Lazarus, in real time, four days after his death, and that real man who really died is really resurrected. There can be no mistaking. This is miraculous. We've seen the infection, we've seen the discussion, we've seen the situation. Let's look at the doctrine. Here's where it gets important. Verse 20 through verse 27. Martha, and I'll make comment as we go. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mar Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Here we see Martha's belief in Jesus' power. He has the power to heal. She's not quite given up on healing yet, okay? Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So, She's a believer in the resurrection. 
And where would she get that? From Daniel chapter 12 and, and old, other Old Testament passages. But Daniel chapter 12, Martha would know well. Daniel 12 too, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, those to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Daniel was given the, the truth of the resurrection from the dead, those who are believing in the true and living God to eternal life, and those who are disbelieving in the, the true and living God to eternal destruction. Daniel was given that centuries before Christ. Martha has those scriptures. She's a faithful worshiper of Yahweh, the true and living God. So she would have known Daniel too. So she says to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. In other words, when you bring everything to an absolute end. But what Jesus does now is he moves himself into the very center of the truth of Daniel 12 too, if you will. He makes himself the one who brings and provides the resurrection. Look at verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Now remember, Jesus has already proclaimed to many that he is the resurrection and the life. He did so in John chapter 5. But his startling statement of chapter 11, verse 26, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, do you believe this? Is his promise that the resurrected life following the death for a believer is a new life that is given that will never die again. And verse 27 is the crescendo of Jesus' earthly ministry. It's where Martha sums up the gospel. She says, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. John included that statement because it bears his whole purpose of his gospel. These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John wants you and I to see and believe who Jesus is, to have to see him as Martha sees him. You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. You are life. So that brings us to our closing section of the narrative. We've seen the infection. We've seen the discussion, the situation. We've seen the teaching. He who believes in me, even though he will die, he will never, he will live. Do you believe this? That's the teaching. Now we get to see, you want proof? The resurrection. Look at verse 28 through 40. 44. When she had said this, he went, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she, that would be Mary, heard it, she got up and quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at the place where Martha met him, somewhere between Jerusalem and Bethany. Then the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, Mary, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. So they, okay, weep with those who weep, mourn, okay, off we go, guys, let's go back to the tomb. Verse 32, therefore, when Mary came to where Jesus was, she saw him, Jesus Christ, and fell at his feet, saying to him, now listen what she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus 
therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Now the phrase deeply moved, folks, it is a phrase that is, should actually be translated like something he snorted with disgust. Now be careful here. Not disgust at the events unfolding of Martha and Mary mourning. Not disgust at the mourners who are with them, but anger at what then? Satan and death. That's what Jesus is deeply moved about. Verse 34. Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35. Jesus wept. It's one of those trivia questions. Watch the shortest verse in the Bible. You've just read it. John chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. But keep in mind, why is he weeping? Jesus knows exactly what he's doing and the outcome of what he's going to do. Lazarus is going to live. Oh, we know that. Oh, we got the scriptures. Of course we know that. But those gathered around didn't know that, but Jesus did. So why? what's his weeping? Because Lazarus will live. His weeping is one of compassion for Martha and Mary and the mourners who are there. A compassion, my dear friend, that Jesus gives to you and I in this day when a loved one dies. Know this, this good and great shepherd, he has compassion for his sheep. There's not a tear that rolls down your cheek that he's not aware of. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him, verse 36. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of a blind man, they're still upset about that, and keep, have kept this man from dying? In other words, I, I don't know. Jesus, again, deeply moved. There's that phrase, snorted with disgust. Within came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the every practical one, the Martha, the sister of the deceased, says to him, Lord, <laughs> by this time he will stench. He's been dead four days. Keep the door closed. Jesus said to her, no, Did I not say to you that if you, will, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? This is a reminder. Martha, did I not tell you I am the resurrection and the life? You who are here today, you're about to see a resurrection. Jesus is saying to you, did I not tell you I'm the resurrection and the life? Here it is. So they removed the stone, verse 40. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Jesus came to earth for the purpose that the wrong of death could be righted that the wages of death, uh, of sin rather, which is death, would be paid in full for those who believe in Jesus Christ for his salvation, for his forgiveness of sin, for he is the good and great shepherd. So let me conclude our time this morning with this. As a believer in Christ, when you get to heaven, I am sure there will be many people whom you will seek out. I don't mean to trouble the widows that are in our church family this morning. But we've had some dear folk go home to be with the Lord. Just recently, decades ago, a 
couple of months ago? Oh, we've got, we've got quite a few by the Crystal Sea on streets of gold. And I can just imagine as they entered into there's Joe Kutzia. There's Bill Brits. Roger Jenkins would have been breathless as he stepped into eternity. As a believer in Christ, when you get to heaven, I am sure there will be many people whom you will seek out. But can I see this after having first seen your risen Savior, because that's who you will see as a believer in Christ. Perhaps one of those you might want to seek out is Lazarus. Go and find the guy, and you'll know him immediately. You're not going to have to ask Roger, hey, Roger, who's, who's Lazarus around here? Can you point him out to me? I want to go and speak to him. No, no, you'll know. You want to know how I can say that? Well, that's another sermon. But you will know Lazarus, so go find him. Because why? We need to thank him for being used of the Lord to come back from death in such a graphic way so that we would believe. Jesus Christ, our good and great shepherd of John chapter 10, has the power over death and life. And that power is yours as a believer. Your deliverance from the sting of death, though, is conditioned. It's conditioned upon belief and faith in Jesus Christ and his salvation given to all who will call upon him. Because it is he and he alone who has sacrificially, substitutionary, died in your place, paid the price you cannot pay, death, so that you can live. That even though you might die, you will let yet live. And you can know this because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And you can know this from that which is recorded in God's word because God in the person of Jesus Christ called forth a real man in real time who really died and really gave him life. Paul understood that truth that Christ can deliver you from death. It's why Paul reminded the Roman church. In Rome, he said to those believers, for not one of us, you and I seated here in Everglen, not one of us lives for himself. And guess what? Not one of us dies for himself. So what's it all about then? Life, what's it about? For if we live, we live for the Lord, here in this corner of his vineyard. And if we die, we die for the Lord, so that people can know and understand, my life in this world is run, but I have life eternal, because my Savior raises the believer from the dead. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's, says Paul to the Roman church in Rome. And John closes off by saying, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, the Bible, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. For Jesus said to Martha, to Mary, to you, to me, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You want proof? He raised Lazarus, a real man in real time who was really dead, and he promises he will do the same if you believe in him for you.
live for him, die for him. You are the Lord's. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the time given us to deal with a, with a subject which is truly troubling to so many in the day in which we live. No one, not anyone, even bowed in prayer at the end of this time in, with you and your word, looks forward to death. It's ugly, but we thank you, Lord, you've removed the sting and the power of death in that you have conquered death, broken the bonds and chains of sin that ensnares us to death and destruction, and you've given us life. Lord, we have been given so much. So thank you for the comfort given your people today in the hearts and minds of each and every one, that even though they may be truly saddened at the, love of a, at the death of a loved one in Christ, they can know that one's at home. O oh Lord, how we envy them. So forgive us for saying it that way. But then thank you, Lord. There are other loved ones in our lives who do not know you. So thank you now for this day and for the days apportioned us where we can go forth and share with them what you've shared with us. You are the good and great shepherd. You are all present, all knowing, all powerful. And you are the resurrection and the life. Help us now to go forth and love you even more because of your first loving us in Jesus' name. Amen.